Hello, everyone, and welcome to United Way. Live United. I'm Terry Westerfield, and joining me today, I am so excited. I have friends in from Catholic Charities Archdiocese of New Orleans, and I want to welcome to our program, first, Sister Marjorie Abair. And Sister Marjorie is the president and CEO of Catholic Charities Archdiocese New Orleans. Hello, Sister. Good morning, Terry. I am so glad you could make it here. And Shannon Murphy Shannon is the director of volunteer services at Archdiocese of New Orleans for Catholic Charities. How are you? Oh, great. Hi, Terry. Good morning. Good morning. And Anna Tujas, who is the associate director of communications for Archdiocese of New Orleans and Catholic Charities Archdiocese of New Orleans. And I want to welcome you all because you are just one of the largest, largest nonprofits in this region. And you're also United Way's largest community impact partner. I know you're an umbrella of agency, health and community services, and that's throughout the Archdiocese area. And I hope that you'll explain because it's just a very, very large and highly populated area. In fact, you have numerous programs serving those literally from birth till they're called home. And United Way is partnering with you on seven of those programs. So it's nice that we can work together and for all that you do. And sister, I'm hoping you can start us off a little bit because we were talking before the program and you were telling me that you are a Marianite. I'm a Marianite sister of Holy Cross. The congregation was established in Lamar, France, but came here almost um, 200 plus years ago. Um, we have our headquarters here worldwide. We have sisters throughout Louisiana, in the Northeast, and still in Canada and in France, in a small community in Burkina Faso, Africa. Wow. Our primary mission was education, but we are in health care as well in social work, in education in all its forms today. And you've been here a long time. We were talking also before the show. You were here during Katrina and after, and were you down in the Ninth Ward, or...? I was living in the Ninth Ward at Holy Angels at the time of Katrina. At that time, I was serving as CEO of Our Lady of Wisdom Healthcare Center and evacuated the 138 residents and went through the real rebuilding process upon our return. So I'm a native New Orleanian and very proud to call it home. I was going to say, I detect a little bit of maybe that in the voice. Yes. <laughs> and that pride comes through. Yes, the West Bank. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, it is coming up at the ninth anniversary, and, and there are so many things we're going to talk about that the Catholic Charities is involved in, but I think that's one thing that always comes to mind is the rebuilding effort. They talk about the rebuilding and the renaissance of this city, and it could not have been done without all the different nonprofits working together. And I know that uh, Catholic Charities really took a lead in a lot of that, and the volunteers. Shannon, I'm thinking what you're here to talk about because – thousands upon thousands I would meet and all working to rebuild the homes and the businesses so we could come back to the city we are and move forward and, and on and upward, as they say. We really did have locals and out of town. A lot of college and high school students helped rebuild New Orleans. There are still a few organizations around that are helping in that rebuild. We're helping in sustaining people, um, and, and we have volunteer efforts that work with people that have returned home and volunteers that can mentor our young people, that can volunteer in one of our head starts, um, that can also you know, assist if they have a language skill or some other talent. Not all of us have a checkbook to be able to write that check, but all of us do have some type of time that we can give. And talent. Yes, exactly, exactly. And that's for high school students. We do a big program over the summer as well as those of our, us that are far away from those high school days. And anybody who wants to get involved, who was listening today, how do they go about volunteering? What kinds of projects are we talking about? Now you're saying mentoring children, and I know you've got so many programs here that you're involved with, so would that be at the Head Start Centers, perhaps even with education service? I mean, it's just, ladies, we won't even have enough time to no, talk about all the things you do. We have a ton. We have a ton of opportunities. What we try and do is, is make it easy because it can be somewhat overwhelming. We have a you know, huge amount of information on our website, ccano.org. Uh, there's a volunteer tab on there, but what we do is we have a once a month meeting for interested or prospective volunteers to learn what Catholic Charities is and to learn about our opportunities. That's at our location um, downtown and we have them once a month um, at four o'clock in the afternoon but we 
we do really have a variety of opportunities, whether teaching people to learn English or working with the little kitties or working with more young adults in our mentoring roles. Now, you just hit upon something. I think it's the natural segue, and whether Sister Marjorie or Anna, you want to jump in. It, it's a little bit, we got a little history of the Maronites here, but Catholic Charities in itself, how did it begin? What is the history there? Is it as old as this city? Yes. <laughs> it's One as, simple word. Yes. It's as old as the arrival of the first Ursuline Sisters in New Orleans. In Catholic Charities USA does acknowledge that as the unofficial official beginning of Catholic Charities, the services, the social services of the Catholic Church uh, to those in need. Those early sisters arrived to take care of the homeless, the battered women, the orphans, and still today we do that to meet the challenges of the homeless of today, the battered women, and the children in all of our contemporary programs and services. And what Sister Marjorie said was very true. Um, we were here since 1727 when the Catholic Church, the Ursuline nuns came to New Orleans, and we continue that service today through what we do, and we're proud to do it. I was just saying it's interesting because, unfortunately, the old adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same, that these, mm -hmm. these social services are still in need, and there are so many people here who benefit from them. But also, I've, I've found it interesting over the years, too, to see when you think of the Catholic Church, but how adaptable you've become because of Catholic Charity, seeing the needs that go on in the community, not only the ones that have been there and may continue for a while longer as we all work together, but as you develop, as you said, the modern day services and, and, and things, how they've differed. Um, I think about what you just mentioned and domestic violence, and that's still a problem, and women and children and the things you do there, and education going back to what you've always done, Sister March, that seems to start at the beginning, and, you, and that's it. The better education we can have, and starting with our very youngest, that opportunity to change the future. And one of the programs that we have is uh, teaching our young people to volunteer. And we're just coming off our sixth year of SERVE. It stands for Students Engaging in Reflective Volunteer Experiences. And it's for our high school students, whether they attend Catholic schools or other schools, uh, to volunteer one week and in that week to work with the homeless population, to work with lower income kids on our Head Start, to work at Good Shepherd School, to work at Second Harvest. And that's where we work with partnerships, but we're trying to teach them what it means to be Catholic and how to do it. And so instead of just going to a high school or getting confirmation hours where you have to do service, this is where you're making a relationship, you're learning more of what it means to be homeless or what it means to be in poverty, and you're working in that location for a whole week. So you're, you're you know, in that young adult, you know, treated more, you know, not necessarily mama's boy, not necessarily, <laughs> you know, completely adult, but, um, and, and learning while you're doing. And then the end of it, we we have the students who make such wonderful um, you know, suggestions and comments. They really know now what it means to be homeless. And they really, you know, it's not just somebody who doesn't want uh, to get a job. It's that what it takes to get there. And they learn more and they can be more reflective in making judgments or not making judgments. And also teaching them the path to what it takes to be a Catholic. And that, you know, you can do little bits um, and not just because your school requires you to do it. Well, you know, when you're talking about this, I see community service in a whole new way because they are literally becoming part of that community and say talking about homeless because that has been a situation here especially post Katrina has always been here but it's definitely in and now new regulations are coming in people are trying to say you have to leave from underneath the Pontchartrain Expressway and some other things but it it needs a whole spectrum of services there needs to be a lot of help from Catholic Church, you have a lot of the programs yourself, but also that interaction with other nonprofits and or companies, government, private partnerships, private public partnerships, because there are such a myriad of reasons. People don't choose necessarily to right. be, be homeless. That yeah. spirit of collaboration is most essential. Um, why do something that somebody else is doing we need to share the resources that we have. So Catholic Charities does work closely to develop these community relationships so that we bring to the table what we have best to give and to do, 
and rely on our community partners to pick up what we don't have or what we cannot do. The other point that I wanted to just um, emphasize is that Catholic Charities does not just serve Catholics. And that's very important. Catholic Charities, as our Archbishop reminds us, we do not serve because people are Catholic. We serve the people because we are Catholic, and that's a critical component in our services. We don't first ask, what religion are you? Oh, all right, come to this part. We serve the need of the individual before us. We seek to see the face of Jesus in that individual, whatever age, in whatever condition or environment they happen to be in. I say in Catholic means universal, right? So again, it, it's, it's, uh, I think that was such a beautiful quote you just had, and that is very important and how powerful, again, the church, the business community, the nonprofits, the, these partnerships that are evolved, because you're right, why duplicate something when together we can create better problem-solving opportunities? Yeah. And truly, you, United Way is a vehicle that gives us that pathway to meet one another and to reach out and collaborate and communicate and better serve the universal needs. And we do, we'd like to say we're a convener, well, that uh, mm -hmm. we can bring people together and, and, and again, look and see what needs to be done and who can best address it. And I know that there have been so many things. First of all, one thing, and I was remiss, and I should have asked from the beginning, we talked about just how large your reach is for the Archdiocese of New Orleans and Catholic Charities. How many parishes, lady, I think, I, I think people would be a little bit aghast when they heard just how many parishes are involved. We serve all eight civil parishes of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, but we also serve the entire state of Louisiana uh -huh, there with we go. many of our programs. And one of those programs is our Food for Families, Food for Seniors program. We have over 300 sites throughout our state that distributes a monthly supplemental food box to seniors and to new mothers in need. So um, definitely our reach is very far reaching um, and map boundaries if there's a need that we see that we can help address. Again, we work with our community partners to collaborate to meet those needs where we see them. And when you have something like that, again, how you see them, how you divvy up the workload, shall we say, how does that come about? Through lots of dialogue and communication and honesty and truthfulness. Yes, we can do. No, we cannot do that. Or you do it better. Let us join you. Uh, we may not have the beds for the homeless. We may have the resources to help another institution with the beds or to feed that group. So in that sense, it's, it's in the communication and everybody coming to the table to do what's best for the broader community. Because it is interesting, there are so many emergency services that you do provide, food and shelter and those kinds of programs and Again, I think about some of the other things you've got going on in terms of counseling, still so very important. Uh, to this day, again, I, I don't mean to keep referencing Katrina, but I think it's that point in our lives we often talk about before and after and with the anniversary here, it, it's making me think about it. But counseling is so important. And you were really on the front lines, not only with food and shelter, but counseling and still are for whether it's those recovering from post-traumatic stress syndrome due to the storm, but the everyday things that can get one down and that we need help. So maybe someone is grieving, maybe someone has lost a job. And again, I just, I'm amazed at how it all works together and how many different programs you have. And, and I'd say that um, we did and, and continue to evolve. We have a program, um, I believe it's in St. Charles um, Parish, school-based counseling. And originally it was um, working with um, children who have been affected by Katrina. But it's continued because the schools in that parish need our resources, and we have them. They have a, um, a and camp. And they had Isaac, Hurricane Isaac mm -hmm. that came. So. That's right. And they have a camp called Girl Power, which is an empowerment camp for teenagers. I believe it's 9 to 12. And, again, you know, we have the staff and resources for certain things. We want to make sure that we're not duplicating what else is being offered um, uh, and that the staff um, are encouraged and um, to be able to reach out um, to other um, nonprofits to work together. I know for our serve camp, we do that with working with Ozanam Inn and Good Shepherd School. 
another very strong part of our counseling program is that which we offer for the children of those who have been incarcerated or those who have been recently released from prison or jail. That's a very, very critical need in our community to work with the families of those individuals who have served time or serving time in jail, those who are coming home. It's a very strong and a much needed program, as well as providing those uh, services for assistance for the individuals who are reentering society. And that's one of the things I know that at United Way and our public policy group has been looking at and because of the high rate of incarceration and it's not just that person or persons but yes how it affects the whole family entire neighborhoods Mm -hmm. our community as a whole certainly and we are also looking at you know the root causes of why we have such a high incarceration rate and to that we have a program called Isaiah 43 which is a parenting and mentoring program where um, its mission is to really build peacemakers of our time to build up our kids to have positive influences in their lives and build up the parents so they have the support and they have the tools that they would need to communicate effectively to their kids to show them that they care so the kids know that they have somebody to look to to feel supported and so they can take that and carry that with them into adulthood and into what they do with their lives. One way that a volunteer could support that is serving as a volunteer mentor to one of our youth in the Isaiah 43 program because, um, you know, we all need each other to be able to improve our city and to be able to give these children better opportunities to be able to be successful and not follow the path that unfortunately um, some of the people in their community have to, to jail or to prison. Um, but to serve as a, a volunteer mentor in, in, in either our Zaya 43 or our Cornerstone Builders program. And talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about the Cornerstone program. Sure. Our Cornerstone Builders program is a program that works with youth whose um, parents are incarcerated. Most of them are younger kids, um, you know, ages 5 to 10. And the mentors and the youth get together at least once a month. Uh, There are opportunities that are organized through the Sisters of the Holy Family around holidays, Easter and Christmas and things like that. But um, it's an opportunity for another adult to care about that person. And um, one thing that I'm often reminded um, through through hearing from staff that work directly with the program is many of us may have had moms and dads that said, you're awesome, you're great, you can do this, you can do this. But um, those of us in the community don't realize that not everyone has had that. And um, young people, when their parents are away, when their parents are in prison, when their parents aren't around, may not have the positive reinforcement that an outside um, adult could bring in and give them the support that they need. How'd you do on that spelling test? Let's practice those words. And some of it would be going to the zoo and doing fun things, but being another adult, being in touch with them and seeing how they're doing. That positive reinforcement Mm -hmm. that they matter. Mm -hmm. That they matter. Another piece of our geography Anna mentioned the eight civil parishes, right? But we also have 102 church parishes. Ah, and yes. And while <laughs> I did speak of our services not being limited to Catholics, we do have a priority for our services of outreach to our church parishes, and that is a very, very important part of the services. We are the official social service arm of the church here in the, the, the metropolitan area. And we have a special concern of being of help to our pastors and the needs of the people in our respective church parishes. And so as we move into this new academic year, Uh, We still operate on that in many ways, the new year. Um, We have a special focus reorganizationally of parish outreach. And over the last several (coughs) months, members of our Catholic Charity staff have met with parish groups to assess and determine the needs and what we could do to assist our pastors in their programs, in their respective parishes, because the social services are also offered by the individual church parishes. We're partners with our clergy. And so much of that is revolving around 
case managers helping um, our people in our church parishes to identify what their needs are and to really work with an individual family or a cluster of families to assist them in working through the systems, whether it's education, whether it's health care, whether it's uh, domestic needs of each individual family. So that will be a very uh, strong impetus of our services directly to our church parishes in the next several months. I say, and it's very important because your parish, the, the uh, priest there and, and sisters, they're the first line. They notice if a, if a child is coming to, to school, to church, uh, perhaps looking to shovel unclean, needs, you know, some help and looking a little on the thin side or mom is not doing so well or you've heard that the father has lost his job. And sometimes people are so proud. I found at United Way, and I believe probably the same with you, so many of those who give of their time, talent, and their hard-earned dollars, when it comes time that they might need to avail them of services, they're too proud. They, they, they don't know how to ask. And so to have someone else who can see, and as you said, get that system going to kind of pay it forward, that, that's a lovely thing. Yes. Well, you've got so many other things coming up. I know we talked about education and you've got some of the other communities that you're uh, working the community and things that you're serving. But one that's always near and dear to my heart too is because of what you do with the elderly. And I'm thinking about the the adult day health care and some of those programs because not only for the individuals themselves but in a sense the respite it provides for family members who sometimes just need that break to do something as simple as as really just spend a few minutes in the shower alone or going out and getting a haircut or picking up groceries and that that's something I know that New Orleans was considered a gray city before the storm we had a large population and now as we baby boomers continue to age there's more of us and the needs are growing there too yes we're very excited about our adult day health care programs um, we're happy to announce that on the west bank at st john bosco center on barataria boulevard the former hope haven um, center uh, we will be opening our newest adult day health care and we're excited about that. That balances out the program that we have in Kenner, the Greenwald Center in Kenner, and also we offer the Pace Center down in the Ninth Ward, the Benson Center, in which we care for the, the elderly. So there's an opportunity for more extensive programs um, serving health care needs, social needs of the elders at the pay center. But for those families who might need that day off or day of help, we offer a daily program. You don't have to come every day. We'd love to have you every day. But there is a fully engaged program of services for the elderly adults. In addition to our adult Health, day health care that we offer in our other program for seniors. We have a magnificent uh, program for our volunteer grandparents. Ah, now that's something I don't think I've heard about. It's the Foster Grandparent Program. It's uh, similar to AmeriCorps. It's, it's technically Senior Corps through the um, U.S. government, and it's for seniors that are low income to be able to give um, back. And they work um, at schools um, throughout the, the greater New Orleans area, and they are um, connected with a young person, either in an aftercare program or in a classroom. But it's their, uh, their way of giving four hours a day, five days a week to that school and to that that child and we have about 80 foster grandparents um, that do magnificent work and um, these are our, our older folks who are not ready to go out to pasture want to stay with us want to stay active and they do uh, remarkable remarkable service in our schools I say they have life life uh, special services themselves they've lived it they know what to go on and again maybe they're part of that group that's providing that 
powerful, positive thinking to these young kids who otherwise may not have that at home. Definitely. Right. And You're right. several of them actually work at um, our Head Start centers. We have five Head Start centers, um, Head Start and Early Head Start, serving um, children from infants up to four years old before they go to kindergarten. And um, it's wonderful that we have the young children being able to work with our foster grandparents, and it's kind of just spanning that whole age range okay. of experience. It's a big circle. <laughs> yes, definitely. So when they talk about from uh, basically from the time you're born to the time you're called home, you really do have services Mm -hmm. in that entire kind of life cycle. Absolutely. And um, in that same track of back to school, um, while it's not by any restricted calendar year, English as a second language is a most important part of our Catholic Charity Services. That along with the other services that we offer to immigrants and refugees. And um, those classes are filled as well and are very critical and important. So uh, just contact us for any additional information that you may need there. Well, let's do that because believe it or not, ladies, I knew we would need more than just a half hour, (laughs) but we're going to come back soon. But in the interim, please, Give us those phone numbers. Give us that web address where people can go for more information. Definitely, they should go to um, our website for Catholic Charities, which is ccano.org, and they can always call us at 504-523-3755, and we can direct them to all our programs and services, whether you need help, you want to give help, or you would like to volunteer. All right, Diane, I'm going to say one more time, let's do it again in Encore, because you know there are people scrambling, and especially if they're... You know, on the other side of the kitchen getting uh, breakfast ready or someone's in the car, they need this information. So one more time. Sure. It's www.ccano.org is our website. Or they can call us at 504-523-3755. And as we are just running out of time, I want to thank you so much for being here, ladies. And Sister Marjorie, Terry, like you have I one more thing. I would be remiss if I didn't say another very special program that we offer to serve or for the mentally and physically disadvantaged and um, developmentally challenged children and adults in our Padua Community Services. Will you come back and talk about that? I'd love the opportunity to come. (laughs) I want you to come back because there are, we've barely touched the tip of this iceberg. And also before we go, I want to say a big thank you again because volunteers are so important and we share a very important volunteer, Mr. Joe Ignatius, who is the uh, president of Whitney Bank, is our board chair this year. And I know that he's been the chair of Catholic Charities. So, Joe, good morning to you. And for all the rest of you, I want to thank so much for joining us. Sister Marjorie Bear, who is the president and CEO of Catholic Charities, Archdiocese of New Orleans. Shannon Murphy, the director of volunteer services. And Anna Tujas are all with Catholic Charities Archdiocese of New Orleans, and I'm Terry Westerfield. And for United Way, everyone, please join me in saying, Live United. United.